A great social prophet once said that we don't fully die until we're forgotten. And perhaps that's why it's so important to be baptized into the death of Jesus. Because Jesus is obviously never forgotten. In fact, every time we gather at the Eucharist, we are reminded that we do this in memory of him. So that as we are baptized into Jesus Christ, we will always live forever. And I think it's fair to say that the Kraft family is rather graced in their ongoing memorializing of their parents, whom they've loved so much, Joan and Wayne, and whom we honor and remember this night. As many of you know, Wayne was a man quite inspired by and also an expert in the works of Taylor de Chardin. And a now famous quote of that great Jesuit paleontologist and theologian goes like this, we're not human beings having a spiritual existence. We are spiritual beings having a human existence. I think that the legacy of the Kraft family, especially Deacon Wayne and his wife Joan, was to remind us and especially their children of the power and the importance of those dimensions of our lives that connect us to the eternally loving and gentle God with whom they now gloriously live. DeSales University is a Catholic Salesian University, is committed to honoring, dignifying, and respecting the human person for its eternal reach and trajectory. Our embrace of Christian humanism of St. Francis de Sales brings our mission to advance the gospel tirelessly. We're delighted that our Salesian Center for Faith and Culture is able to work as a strong chamber of the heart of our great university. And we're also delighted for its friendship with the Kraft family, especially Ellen Kraft, whom I now ask to come to the microphone fresh from sunny, warm Florida for a few remarks and to introduce our esteemed speaker. Thank you for coming. Not real fresh from Florida, but <clears throat> my name is Ellen Kraft. I'm the youngest of the four Kraft children. Uh, my older brothers, Steve and Brian, are both here this evening, as is my nephew, Ben, and my sister-in-law, Margo. My husband is still in Florida, <laughs> and my husband, Kevin, is over in Kenya. My husband, my brother, Kevin. <laughs> Freudian slip there. Lori asked me to say a few words tonight about my father, Wayne Craft. It's hard to say a few words about him without saying a few words about my mom because they really were a team their entire lives. But tonight's lecture is about Teilhard de Chardin. We all learned to say that very early on, by the way. A French Jesuit paleontologist who captured my father's intellect and his soul for as long as I can remember. As a young child, dad was often in his den at our home writing his books on Teilhard. He wrote at least four, if I recall correctly, and he was not to be disturbed while writing. Unless mom and I were making Christmas cookies, in which case, with interruption with cookies in hand, was welcome. Dad loved to talk about Teilhard, to his philosophy students here at DeSales, to his engineering students at Lehigh, to the men on his Curcio weekends, to family, friends, and neighbors, to anyone who would listen. He struggled to write and to lecture to others in an ongoing attempt to make Teilhard come alive for everyone else. He felt called, almost obliged, to open the door to Teilhard's philosophy so that others could reconcile the intellectual and the spiritual aspects of their own lives. And he succeeded in doing that for many people, some of whom are here tonight. I regularly hear from people who are dad's students or colleagues who tell me that dad was responsible for introducing them to Teilhard de Chardin and to the concept that science and theology are not only compatible, but are necessary to each other's existence and full comprehension. Dad told me on numerous occasions that Teilhard helped him make sense of this world, that Teilhard helped him be a better engineer and scientist, and at the same time, a better person, a more complete person, and a more content person. Now, I do not have either a scientific or a mathematical mind. And having struggled for over three decades to try to simply get through one of my father's books, I have concluded, rightfully or wrongfully, that both are somewhat essential to fully appreciate Teilhard. So in conjunction with DeSales University, our family decided it would be nice for someone else to carry on Dad's torch for Teilhard. 
And that's why we have Sister Kathleen Duffy here tonight to present the Kraft Memorial Lecture. Sister Duffy is a professor of physics at Chestnut Hill College, having received her BS, her MS, and her PhD all in physics and all from Drexel. I'm from Saint, I went to St. Joe's, so I'm sorry for you. She teaches courses as varied as principles of physics, the science of music, astronomy, art as a lens for science and religion, and science as the sacred, just to name a few. Her scholarly interests are in atomic and molecular physics, nonlinear dynamics, science and religion, again to name a few, and the spirituality and philosophy of Teilhard de Chardin. She has lectured extensively on Teilhard de Chardin. I located her on the Teilhard Association website because dad was real involved with that and I thought it would be a good place to start. She has written several books on Teilhard, one of which I tried to read over the last few months. And see how thin it is? <laughs> I don't have that brain. I begged off of her quantum mechanics and chaos theory for beginners. I opted instead for Teilhard's mysticism, and it still took me about three months to get through it. But I don't think that way. I'm hoping that she will share with us her vision of Teilhard and some other um, interesting points of view, and we welcome you here tonight, Sister Kathleen Duffy. <laughs> That's all right. That's all, always the way. <laughs> so it's wonderful to be here. It's such an honor, really. I've he I heard so much about Wayne uh, from uh, his friends uh, who would attend with me uh, the Cosmos and crea Creation uh, events every year for the last 37 years, I think it is, uh, a group of scientists comes together to try to uh, figure out how science and religion come together without the help of the theologians. So, uh, and that's not completely true. But um, he was a faithful member of that group, and each year we pray for him. And so I'm always reminded of his presence among us uh, there. And I think I also, in looking through his book, uh, you know, there's something similar in the way we look at Teilhard, because um, I'm a physicist, he was an engineer. We probably look at it more, uh, more the same than uh, I would with a biologist or a theologian or whatever. So um, it's really an honor then to be, to be here and to uh, speak uh, at this lecture. So th this evening, I would like to talk a little bit about Teilhard de Chardin. He was born in um, 1881. And as a child, he was very interested in geology. In 1899, soon after high school, he entered the Jesuit order. And during his formation period, he continued to gather fossils and specimens of rock and to map out the geological landscape wherever he found himself. While studying theology, he became interested in evolution and aware that the church's position on evolution was quite negative he resolved to develop a way to help people to see evolution and incarnation as part of a single cosmic process. After his formation period, he began the formal study of theology and paleontology, but his studies were interrupted when he was conscripted into the French army. He served uh, with the army until 1919 as a stretcher bearer during World War I. Ironically, during the lulls between battles, he found time to work out his synthesis of evolution and incarnation. And in the years that followed, he continued to write and to strive to make this connection ever more clear. Unfortunately, the Jesuits, under pressure from Rome, never allowed Teilhard to publish his brilliant synthesis. So this evening, what I would like to do is explore with you the details of this, of this particularly painful and confusing issue in Teilhard's life, the fact that he was not able to publish. So we begin in 1922 with Teilhard as a young and successful 
finally professed Jesuit priest and university professor at the Institut Catholique in Paris. At that moment, it seemed that life couldn't be better. Teilhard had completed his Jesuit formation program. He had developed an intimate spiritual relationship with his cousin Marguerite and felt much support from her kindred spirit. He had spent four years as a stretcher bearer during World War, the French, in the French Army during World War I and received honors for his exemplary service. The war was a time of great inner growth for him. He served alongside men from all parts of the French Empire, helping to broaden his worldview. During the war, he composed the first of his religious essays, an exercise that helped him clarify some of the details of his synthesis. He had hoped to share his views with others, especially with those who, who found the um, theory of evolution interfered with their belief in Christ and those who found the Christian teachings about creation outdated and somewhat childish. After the war, Teilhard completed his studies in geology and paleontology with a great paleontologist, Marceline Boulle. He passed his dissertation examination with high honors and received many awards. His popularity as a professor and lecturer was soaring, especially among the young students and the seminarians. He now had a mission to share his vision regarding the role of Christ in the evolutionary cosmos. His energy was vibrant. It was vibrant enough to electrify all of Paris, and Paris was ready for him. His life seemed to hold such promise. He did, however, have some inkling that things could go amiss. The atmosphere in Rome at the time was becoming quite ominous, especially for those who, like Teilhard, were trying to update the church teaching. But unlike Teilhard and some of his Jesuit friends, the church was not interested in any sort of updating. Instead, it was set on defending herself against modernism. And clearly, Teilhard's evolutionary ideas smelled of modernism. In response to the Vatican's concern, the, the Jesuit order installed its own board of censors to which all Jesuits wishing to publish had to submit their manuscripts. Working in the field of science, Teilhard might have considered himself safe, at least safer than his Jesuit friends in theology, who were having a good bit of difficulty with the censors regarding this issue. But now he was beginning to sense some criticism. So to escape the fire, he decided to respond to an open invitation he had received from his Jesuit from the Jesuit paleontologist, Emile Lisson, the founder and director of a museum in Tinsen, China. Teilhard agreed to spend a few months with Lisson to join his fossil finding expeditions and help him analyze some of the specimens in his growing collection. After a year and a half, Teilhard was finally permitted by his superiors to return to Paris. And he was extremely happy to be back and to continue his work at the Institut Catholique. Soon after his return in 1924, the sword fell. He was summoned to Lyon by his provincial Père Costa de Beauregard about a paper he had written two years earlier. It seems that in 1922, after a spirited lecture in Belgium, a lively discussion ensued, with Teilhard speculating freely about new ways to understand original sin in light of evolutionary theory. At the request of the theologians, he wrote a follow-up note made seven copies, sent a few to his friends whom he felt he could trust, 
and kept one copy in his drawer, his desk drawer. In, in this short essay called Note on Some Possible Historical Representations of Original Sin, Teilhard discusses the problem with a, the, with a literal interpretation of the story about Adam and Eve, original sin, and the Garden of Eden found in Genesis. And he also came up with three potential solutions. Actually, he didn't particularly endorse any of them. It was a, a brainstorming session about how we could get around such, you know, such a, a, a story and how, how to, instead of just throwing it away, how to uh, work through it and uh, save the story. However, in some mysterious way, a copy of the note reached the Jesuit Curia and the Jesuit General, Assist the General Regional Assistant Superior General for France asked Costa to speak to Teilhard and tell him to submit a written promise to avoid dealing with these issues in the future. When Teilhard received the letter, he was distraught. His distress was almost unbearable. He wrote immediately to his friend, Auguste Valençon, in desperation, asking him to meet with him before his meeting with Costa. My dear friend, he said, help me. They want me to promise in writing that I will never say or write anything against the traditional position of the church on original sin, a statement that he felt was too vague and too absolute. At their meeting, Père Costa relayed the final decision of the Jesuit general, Vladimir Ledichovsky. Teilhard was to promise in writing to stop speaking and writing, both in public and in private, about anything contrary to the church's traditional dogmatic teaching on original sin as traditionally interpreted. Otherwise, he would be dismissed from the order. Teilhard tried to bargain. He felt that he should, in conscience, reserve for himself the right to carry on research with professionals and the right to bring help to the disturbed and the troubled, especially those who found it difficult to believe. He suggested an alternative statement, one that he felt he could sign in good conscience. He said he would, he would um, bind himself not to spread not to carry out, carry on proselytism for the particular explanations contained in the note, which he actually didn't support that much anyway. Though still reluctant, he was willing at least for a time to give up publishing his ideas, but was never willing to stop exploring them. Teilhard wrote to the Jesuit Curia to clarify his position and to reassure them that he would be in compliance. Also, his provincial Per Costa did try to intervene with Ledichovsky. Others, including the rector of the Institut Catholique, which, who, was, um, uh, who was concerned about losing a professor as fine as Teilhard, also requested that Ledichovsky change his mind and be less harsh. But by this time, the general was not willing to back down. Incensed at the content of Teilhard's note and aware of the repercussions it could have for the Jesuit order, Ledichovsky decided to put an end to Teilhard's influence. Teilhard was left with two options. To sign a series of six propositions, five of which were taken directly from documents issued at the Council of Trent and the First Vatican Council, and another, a statement about Adam and Eve as our sole parents, or the other alternative was to be expelled from the order. This was an impossible decision for him, a total shock. He wasn't ready to give up being a priest or a Jesuit. Those were serious and sacred commitments and he wasn't ready to give up his spiritual independence, a quality so deeply inculcated into the Jesuit persona and so highly valued by him. He felt alone, 
unable to determine the next step. Two choices, obedience or freedom of conscience. He wrote to Valenson, I've been keeping up appearances, but inside me there's something like a real agony, a real storm. Teilhard found himself in a situation that was doing violence to all that he felt called to and all that he hoped for, a situation that he knew he was not able to change no matter what he did. So after much anguish, prayer, discussion with friends, and consultation with his provincial, he chose the first option, and although he signed the propositions, he was in interiorly clear about maintaining his spiritual freedom while keeping to the letter of the law. The ramifications were severe. Teilhard was no longer welcome in Paris, where he felt he could be most effective. He returned to China and soon after was required to relinquish his position at the Institut Catholique. While surrendering the opportunity to teach and publish his revolutionary ideas, he could never abandon his personal search and his call to reform the church from the inside. He resolved instead to de dedicate himself to deepening his synthesis. He said, if I were to desert the place that life has assigned me, I would betray the world. However, this new development was making it almost impossible for him to reach his goal. His professional future was being severely curtailed. He was blocked from receiving the kind of worldwide feedback that publication provides, feedback that would have honed his ideas and um, that he hoped would broaden eventually into, or would blossom into um, a, a much broader synthesis. And his struggle with the church and his order continued, as did the trauma, especially as he strove during the 1940s to have his major work, The Human Phenomenon, approved by the Roman censors for publication. But he refused to be daunted. Over the years, he actually worked harder than ever to make his ideas clear. And because he was not always silent, especially when he was asked questions, and because he continued to circulate his essays among interested friends, new restrictions were imposed. All of this had a terrible effect on his body. Chronic anxiety, weakness caused by unhealthy living conditions during his years in Peking, and a major heart attack most likely due the, to in part to severe stress that resulted from his attempts to publish the human phenomenon. Teilhard struggled with this issue throughout his life. It was never really resolved. Even during his last days, he was not welcome in Paris. And since at the time he was unable to return to China because of the political situation there, he spent his final days at the Winner Gren Foundation in New York City, still writing and still believing that his message would survive his death. Before he left Paris, he willed his papers to Jean Mortier, who published them posthumously. Fortunately, we do have his work in the best shape that he could manage to leave it. So we have 13 volumes of his uh, religious essays, and works and uh, 10 volumes of his scientific papers. So he was really prolific. Now, at first glance, it might seem that Teilhard was foolish to continue to expect the church to change her opinion of his work, especially for an issue so um, difficult as this one. For years, his friends encouraged him to leave the church. They failed to understand Teilhard's devotion to an order that seemed not to recognize his value and that opposed the circulation of his thought. But for Teilhard, leaving the church or the, and or the order was short-sighted. He believed his call was to reform the church from within. Leaving would send a message in direct conflict with his conviction that what the world needed most in, in order to face the growing problems of the day 
was a renewed church, not an abandoned one. And little by little, it was clear that many of the Jesuits, including the next general, uh, Jean-Baptiste Jensen, were becoming more sympathetic to his call, to his cause, rather. Eventually, he could see that his order was trying to protect him and themselves from even more severe restrictions by the church, and his, that his censors were not really able to understand what he was talking about. Still, the restrictions remained, and suspicion would surface whenever his name came into prominence. And only after his death was his dream of publication realized, but then it was too late for feedback, revision, and further development, at least by him. I would like now to, to consider Teilhard's response to this experience, both while he was struggling with Ledichovsky's decision and also throughout the rest of his life. Here I rely on Constance Fitzgerald's analysis of impasse about the dark night. She's a wonderful chapter about that. And on uh, Joan Chittister's um, book called uh, Scarred by Struggle, uh, and where she presents an ana the anatomy of struggle. And to be clear, when I talk about struggle, I mean something more than difficulty. Rather, I mean the response to an experience that triggers great anguish that touches the depths of the soul and that causes shock to one's whole being. Such shock attacks the ego. And often a person's first re, re, um, response or impulse is to fight against the event using logic and other means. However, these usually have no effect, especially in such serious and complicated situations. This kind of resistance tends to reinforce the ego, encourage violence, and further alienates the parties involved. A second option is to stay open while searching for the underlying reasons for the situation's occurrence, to examine the flow of events for errors in judgment, to let go of anything that would reinforce the ego and to allow a new self to emerge. Shock is actually a call to higher consciousness, an effective, effective means of self-transformation, but only if dealt with in this second way, a way that is assuredly very challenging. Teilhard's interaction with his general is a clear example of this kind of struggle. It involves an issue that meant everything to Teilhard. Ledichovsky's decision left Teilhard shocked, almost paralyzed, not knowing what to do next. Usual ways of resisting were not working for him. But instead of allowing himself to be defeated, he dealt with his anguish in the following ways. His first response was to allow the anguish to touch his soul. Instead of distracting himself from the pain, he brought his suffering to prayer and called out to God for help. He must have felt some consolation but grief work, as we all know, takes time. He also cried out to his friend, Auguste Valençon, who was per particularly supportive. Their discussion of the problem on the morning before Teilhard's first meeting with his provincial made it easier for Teilhard to grasp the situation as it really was, rather than to rely on false hopes of a quick resolution. Teilhard was also, also used all available means, spiritual means, of dealing with the issue. He engaged in prayer, in counseling, in a week-long discernment retreat. He wanted to understand the extent of his responsibility to comply with the restrictions. Ever convinced of the rightness of what he was trying to accomplish, he remained open to learning what was really happening and why. He also found concrete nonviolent ways of resisting. For instance, he composed an alternative statement that he knew he could live with. Although the statement was never accepted, composing it helped him to resolve 
to, um, to understand ever more clearly the depth of his commitment and to resolve ever more tenaciously never to abandon it. And then finally, exhausted by his attempts to find creative solutions to the dilemma, he could see no way out. He recognized that a roadblock of this magnitude is a signal to surrender. Reflecting a few years later on this experience, he gives the following advice to those who must finally surrender. He says, as long as resistance is possible, resist. Should you meet with defeat, still inwardly resist. Though you're stifled and constrained, your efforts will still be sustained. Eventually, Teilhard did surrender and did sign the six propositions. The fourth proposition was at first the very troublesome one. Since taken at face value, it involved a scientific statement about evolution, not a religious statement, and therefore it was not within the purview of the church. Perhaps Teilhard realized this so that when he signed all six, he was clear that he was not relinquishing his freedom to believe in the science of his day and that he was still able to continue his work, the work that he knew he needed to do. And Teilhard never gave up. He resisted as far as possible and sometimes even a little more than he should have until the day he died. He continued to write. We now have those 13 volumes of his religious writings and he found an effective loophole. Having his essays duplicated and distributed to friends and to all those who were interested in what he had to say, sometimes 20, 200 copies at a time. Since these papers were not official publications, this action was not in violation of his promise. His strength of character and deep spiritual life allowed him to resist the temptation to malign his oppressors. He was neither arrogant nor resentful uh, and did understand that the pressure the church was placing on the Jesuit generals was severely complicating the issue. Having surrendered though, he was free to develop his thought and to look for more creative ways of carrying out his mission. So instead of pouting, he went on with life and became very creative. He was optimistic about the future of the church, imagine. Even when there seemed to be no hope, he believed that one day he would be able to publish. He continued to revise his essays, especially the human phenomenon, and to send them to Rome in hopes that they would pass the censors and be published. He spoke honestly with his provincials and his generals, often telling them that this is what needs to be done, um, and only putting him in, himself in further difficulty, but always with the hope that things would change and that they would understand. He suffered deeply, not only mentally and spiritually, but also physically. As he aged, his health began to fail, his depression worsened, and though he never gave up, um, uh, and never gave in to the feeling, he found it difficult at times to go on with life. But somehow he was always able to return to the divine milieu, the, that place of inner comfort where he could sense the rightness of his mission and feel the consolation of Christ, Omega. Teilhard's commitment to his decision to remain within the church was not an act of cowardice or apathy. Rather, it was totally consistent with his mission of union. As he says, to become a vital part of any organization, one must love its mission, live its mission to the full, and participate in its future. Clearly, Teilhard loved and lived the church's mission to the full, but he found his desire to participate in its future thwarted. Hence, he also understood that a Christ Christian must be ready to suffer for the church and sometimes even by the church. And to abandon the institution, especially at a time when his work for change seemed urgent, felt contradictory. Instead, he sacrificed his individual preference 
while continuing to see his work as vital to the church, even though his power to effect change within the organization was minimal. Teilhard's uh, decision was also um, consistent with his firm trust in the goodness of humanity, as well as with his evolutionary worldview. He, be eventually, he believed that eventually things would change, that ex excesses would be minimized, that people would see the light and that good would triumph. But he also knew that evolution is a slow process and that struggle is an essential part of that process, a process that often resembles the royal road of the cross. So he continued refining the sap he was extracting from the great tree that is the church and challenging all those who were impeding its growth. And new shoots would eventually emerge, though not until after his death. His writings did have an impact on the Second Vatican Council. The next Jesuit general, Pedro Arupe, encouraged much more Jesuit involvement in the world, especially in peace and justice issues. The Vatican has been sponsoring workshops on faith and science with top scientists and theologians. And now we have a Jesuit pope who is also trying his best to make changes in the church for the life of the world. Slow movement toward ever greater consciousness. Eventually, Teilhard began to see the importance of his synthesis for social, political, and religious organizations and applied what he learned from his personal struggles to the world scene. Distressed about the onset of World War II, he was nevertheless hopeful that deeper awareness of the world situation and greater enthusiasm for building a better world might result. He says, this tremendous war which so afflicts us, this universal longing for a new order, what are they but the shock, the tremor, and the crisis beyond which we may glimpse a more synthetic organization of the human world? So he's connecting this with his own experience of shock. He knew from his experience with his order that times of instability and unrest such as these often spark greater consciousness. That shocking experiences can encourage new ways of doing things, heightened responsibility for the other and for the future, and greater participa participation in the world. The challenge would be if and when peace would come, how to sustain interest in such a difficult and long-range pro project. Teilhard tried to analyze the situation and imagine a response that would be creative and effective. He wondered what steps and attitudes would be needed for humanity not only to survive as a species, but also to flourish and eventually to bring about union and coherence to our world. Regarding world affairs, two questions seem vital. Whether or not there's hope for survival, um, for the survival of the human species in spite of the global chaos of his day, and if in fact there is hope, how to determine the best line of action to ensure humanity's flourishing? Questions that are, are rather appropriate for today. To answer these questions, he relied on, as usual, on his understanding of the dynamic creative patterns that are operating in the cosmos as a whole, namely the principle of creative union and the law of complexity consciousness. These are two patterns that he, he uh, devised as he was uh, you know, working in, uh, with the fa fossils that he, uh, that he would find. From the beginning of time, Whenever two uh, entities unite, seeding their individuality but not their identity, <clears throat> they have become something new, something more, something surprising. And he calls this pattern creative union. Examples from the early um, universe, nuclei, 
uh, and electrons that join to form atoms. The atom is more than the nucleus itself. Atoms combine to form molecules. Molecules unite to form cells. Cells form organize, organisms. Each of these is a step in greater complexity, and um, be, each of these entities become more. Each union produces an entity that is more complex, more surprising, and capable of more than the individual. Creative union has implications on the social level as well. When two people marry, when a group forms an organization, or shares a research project, the result is an entity capable of, of accomplishing much more than the individual alone. So throughout the history of the universe, matter has been complexifying and producing ever more novel forms. This led Teilhard to believe that the universe is convergent and that union is its final goal. He also believed that what we call matter is not purely material. Rather, all matter from the most elementary particles to plants and animals, and finally to humans, is imbu imbued with subjectivity, agency, interiority. During his experience with animal fossils in the field, he had noticed a correlation between brain size and consciousness, between physical complexity and spiritual capacity. And that's where this law of complexity consciousness comes from. The, the law of complexity consciousness tells us that as matter complexifies, it becomes capable of greater consciousness. And as matter becomes more conscious, it, become, it, um, it encourages greater complexity. Another creative process that has implications for social organizations as well. Teilhard's analysis parallel, uh, parallels in many ways the relatively new science of complexity, a science I think your dad would, would have really loved. It, he probably was interested in it. You know, it was, came out probably right around the time before he died. Like Teilhard's theory of creative union, complexity theory is concerned with uh, the emergence of novelty and the way structures form. It turns out that a collection of relatively simple entities can, without the benefit of a central controller, organize itself into a collective whole that creates patterns, uses information, evolves, and learns. So when driven far from equilibrium, a chaotic system, such as a society during global turmoil, interacts with its environment in complex and nonlinear ways. And as it does, it develops the potential to change and to produce something new. Often a few simple rules suffice to explain the emergence of the new pattern. And if when a critical point is reached and so long as turbulence is avoided, the resulting patter pattern is held together by what is called a strange attractor. However, transitions to novel forms usually happen only in an atmosphere of instability and high energy at what scientists call the edge of chaos, the critical point between order and turbulence. Where for a complex system, communication is high and creativity optimum. Unstable and flexible enough to change, but not turbulent, systems at the edge of chaos are creative. So he's relating, I mean, I'm relating this to Teilhard's experience of shock and how the shock in his own experience um, drove him to become a, a new kind of person. And just as, um, you know, his um, hope for the world after World War II was that it, the shock of the war would um, move the, the world into another spot that was more complex and more conscious. <clears throat> so I have a, an example here. For the, the complexity scientists have been studying 
the collective social behavior of insects, fish, and birds. And one particularly stunning example is a phenomenon known as the murmuration of starlings. Has anyone ever had that experience of seeing thousands and thousands of starlings just, well, you're gonna have it now. <laughs> a, fly, a flock of starlings flies as a single bird contracting and expanding, soaring up and then driving, diving down into the trees. This flock has no single leader. Instead, it's a decentralized system in which the flock's cohesive movement is created by interaction among the birds in the flock as a whole. To attempt to understand the swarm intelligence, a group of researchers recently spent three years videotaping and analyzing the movements of very large flocks of starlings, about 30,000, I think, there were in the flock that they were looking at. And using sophisticated software, they determined the position of the individual birds and with a computer model, simulated the movement of every individual to try to understand how the movement of a given bird is affected by its neighbors. They found two very interesting results. There's the individual bird. And often thought to be not so beautiful and, you know, a pest. But this uh, is very interesting, the results. The first is that each bird stays equally distant from its seven nearest neighbors. So it's, it's local, it's locally, you know, it's becoming uh, connected locally, not globally. There's no global leader. It's, the, um, it's this uh, connection between the birds, um, uh, just being aware. So when my neighbor moves, I have to move too. Since the distance between birds is now not fixed, the, the flock is free to expand and contract. The second is that the birds at the edge of the flock tend to bunch closer together, constricting the flock, so that it tends to fly as a whole in the same general direction. So swarm behavior is an effective strategy for survival. The need to escape a predator drives the starlings to interact in a coherent, highly organized way making the flock look like a large creature, a phenomenon that mesmerizes the predator. It's almost as if a strange attractor is keeping the bird centered. Because each individual bird accepts a goal larger than itself, the starling swarm behaves like a single organism. No single creature is in charge. Instead, each member acts on local information to produce complex collective behavior. So rather than being controlled by external influences, the swarm exhibits a dynamical order in which each bird cooperates to perform a coherent function. This dynamism is made possible because the predator drives the swarm far from equilibrium and helps each bird access the energy needed. This flock is an organized, dynamical system with emergent properties. So what I would like you to watch this. It's, I, um, a couple years ago, I put um, one of these YouTube videos to music, and you would think the birds were listening to the music. So a piece of music. It's The Swan by Saint-Saëns. Yes, it, and isn't it amazing the way they're you know, dancing to it. Um, <clears throat> so, but what is the force that will initiate among us and sustain within us a more coherent approach to the problems that beset our world? So I hope you can see the connection here. Um, you know, to the, um, this is not just about looking at beautiful birds, but you know, the question is how can we be coherent, right? So, and, and what is the force that will help us? And so for Teilhard, he attributes this unifying force um, to, uh, that will help us to transition to a more mature humanity to the person of the cosmic Christ, who though never compelling, ever alluring, ever attracting, impels the cosmos forward. Christ is a divine attractor who acts from the future, continually guiding the, the cosmos, personalizing it, amorizing it, 
forbidding it to recognize its privileged position at the evolutionary front and taking um, a transformative step toward greater consciousness. So in a eulogy delivered at a funeral service that was celebrated for Teilhard in France two weeks after Teilhard's death in New York City, his good friend, superior, uh, friend and superior, René Dwens, spoke highly of Teilhard's many accomplishments and outstanding qualities. But in the end, he made mention of Teilhard's participation in the church and in the world. And he said, Teilhard was one of the few Jesuits in his generation who shared so deeply and with such passion in the hopes, the efforts, and the boundless ambition of his time. I suppose that such a deep commitment to the future of both church and world is not surprising for a person who took his commitments so seriously. Thank you. <laughs>